Okay, I think we're going to get started now. Um, we'll start uh, by um, thanking a bunch of people as these things uh, often work. Um, this was an idea that some of us had in uh, after, I think it partly in, inspired by an event that took place in the US um, organized by the American Association for the History of Medicine. And we thought there's a lot of uh, work being done in Canada and we'd like to showcase some of that um, historical work on the significance of pandemics and epidemics um, for a Canadian audience. Um, I couldn't have done this without a lot of support from various panelists, some of whom you'll meet tonight and some of whom you'll meet hopefully at future seminars. Um, especially I wanna thank St. John's College, which helped me with some organizing work uh, early on, especially Amy Craddock. Um, the Canadian Society for the History of Medicine, which has been um, supporting this event, including uh, giving us a bit of funding to hire Chris Colesso, um, who will be um, from now on handling most of your registrations and questions um, going forward. Um, I wanna thank above all, I guess, Anya uh, Moody Foster, who's in the back there. Um, Anya works at the Manitoba Museum and through um, a friend of mine, Leah Morton, we connected uh, about getting some support for hosting an event like this, um, which I've never done. Um, and also the museum has webinar, webinar add-ons. So we're very thrilled um, with uh, Anya's support. I couldn't have done it without her. Um, so this is a Zoom webinar, which means that you're only gonna be able to see and hear the presenters. And there is a chat function um, that's on the bottom of your screen there. Um, and you can write comments and questions at any time, but th those comments are only available or visible to the panelists. Um, so we will have a question and answer session at the end. Um, and that's the, the best way, if you have questions or comments that you wanna make um, to type them into the chat function. Um, this presentation and the session will be recorded and posted on this Canadian Society for the History of Medicine Facebook page. And if you don't follow them already on Facebook, you can access it through their website. So first we're gonna have short presentations from each of our three panelists which includes myself, uh, Professor Magda Farney, and Professor Mark Humphreys. And then the three of us are going to chat with each other a little bit, responding to comments that we've made um, on tonight's theme, which is um, historians, flu historians responding to COVID-19. And then at the end, we'll open it up for audience questions and comments. And we're hoping that the whole thing will be about an hour or maybe a little bit longer. Um, so first of all, we'll do um, presenter self-introductions. So Magda, would you like to introduce Great, uh, I hope everyone can hear me. My name is Magda Farney. I've been a member of the history department at UCAM, the Université du Québec à Montréal since 2002. I'm a historian of uh, 19th and 20th century Quebec and Canada. I specialize in the history of women and gender, uh, the history of families, the history of health, and the history of welfare. And uh, some years ago now, I spent uh, several years actually working on the influenza pandemic of 1918 and 19. And with Assault, I co-edited a volume on influenza that came out in 2012. Mark, do you want to introduce yourself? Great. Uh, well, first of all, thank you for having me um, as part of this panel. Uh, I'm a professor, associate professor of history at Wilfrid Laurier University. And I've been there since uh, 2014. And I was at Memorial University before that. Um, I'm a history of medicine scholar as well as uh, kind of a, a general Canadianist, but I work on military history too. Um, I've written on shell shock in the First World War, uh, but my dissertation was on the 1918 flu, and that came uh, or eventually turned into a book that came out in 2012 called The Last Plague, uh, which looked basically at the 
public health response to the 1918 flu in Canada. And I also have a paper uh, in, in uh, that edited collection um, Agda was just mentioning uh, a few minutes ago. Um, and I've written a number of papers kind of on the historical epidemiology of the flu, as well as public and popular responses in Canada. Um, I think like most of you have been following the COVID-19 uh, situation uh, very closely. Um, as a result, and I've been doing lots of media interviews um, in Canada and, and internationally around the flu um, over the past few months, which has been interesting, uh, to say the least. So, uh, Ezlet, over to you. I'll just briefly introduce myself a little bit more. Um, I'm Ezlet Jones. I teach in the Department of History and I'm Dean of Studies at St. John's College, which, was, which is an affiliate college at University of Manitoba. Um, I was trained partly as a social historian, a historian of working class history, but ended up like Mark writing a dissertation on influenza. So both of us are kind of uh, intersectional historians, I suppose, in that way, um, speaking to a few different fields at once. And there was a there was a bit of a kind of a moment, I think, for flu history in the early late 2000s, early 2010s. And a lot of us did work at that time. I published a, my dissertation is published as a book um, called Influenza 1918 Disease, Death and Struggle in Winnipeg, which is where most of my research focuses. And I still write sometimes about influenza, but mostly I write now on the history of socialized medicine in Canada. Um, so yeah, it's a returning to a subject that has been part of, of um, my scholarly career really since I was a graduate student um, in a in a set of circumstances that I don't think I ever anticipated, really, um, uh, despite all, all of the pandemic anxieties leading up to um, the outbreak of COVID-19, I don't think I still really understood at all what that would be like. So, um, okay, so we're gonna start our presentations and Magda is gonna go first. She'll talk for about 10 minutes or so, and then we'll go over to Mark, um, and then I will go last. Okay, so many thanks uh, to Esselt for organizing this roundtable. We've all been struck, I think, over the past few months uh, by the keen interest among the media for history and for what history might teach us in the current context. And it seems as though more than ever, uh, historians have been present uh, on the radio, on TV, in the press. Uh, and not just, what's interesting, not just historians of epidemic disease, uh, as might be expected, but also historians of nursing, historians of women's work, and historians of old age. And so this public interest, uh, this renewed public interest in pandemic history uh, has given me, as I think it has Esselt and Mark, uh, the um, opportunity to think again uh, and to think in new ways about research that I did some time ago. And like many historians and like non-historians as well, I've seen a number of parallels with 1918 uh, from the relatively basic public health measures that we've been encouraged to adopt. So frequent hand washing, uh, staying at home, whether we're ill or not, avoiding crowds, uh, to um, things like the impact of COVID-19 on the livelihoods of Canadians, including Canadians who have been fortunate enough not to fall ill. Beyond these parallels, and there, and there are many, I've also been interested in the differences between the two contexts. And in fact, it's, it's on the differences that I'm going to focus my uh, talk tonight or my intervention tonight. The focus of my talk is Quebec, which is the historical case that I know best in the case of influenza. Uh, and it's also the vantage point from which I'm watching current events unfold. One of the most uh, striking dim dimensions of the COVID-19 pandemic as it's played out around the world has been the importance of age as a category of analysis. Age was important in 1918-19 as well. Uh, I think that every historian of the influenza pandemic has remarked upon the extent to which the flu targeted young adults between the ages of 20 and 40. Uh, in Montreal, the average age of those who died of influenza in the fall of 1918 was 25, and this was the case both for men and for women. And so what this meant in 1918-19 was that the flu attacked breadwinners, male breadwinners usually, but it also attacked young parents, 
and Essel's work in the archives of the Mother's Allowance Commission of Manitoba in the early 1920s shows that a significant number of working class mothers left without a breadwinner after the pandemic relied upon new provincial welfare measures such as mother's allowances in order to support their children. So the brunt of the flu epidemic, the brunt of the epidemic in 1819 was borne by adults in their 20s and 30s. This time around, it's the elderly who've been the most severely targeted by pandemic illness. As of June 3rd, almost 98% of COVID-19 deaths in Quebec were of persons over the age of 60 with a full 92% of these deaths striking people over the age of 70. The COVID-19 deaths in Quebec, and as of yesterday, there were uh, almost 4,800 in, in all, uh, these deaths have brought to public attention a state of things of which many Quebecers were already all too aware before the pandemic, and that is the disastrous state of long-term care homes in Quebec. Um, this is the case both of public long-term care homes, known as CHSLD in Quebec, and private long-term care centers. And like their counterparts in other provinces, these institutions are chronically understaffed. Um, as in other provinces, the past 15 years or so have seen an increasing number of private institutions, read for-profit institutions, opening their doors. And what we've seen over the past few months are outbreaks of COVID-19 in long-term uh, care homes in Quebec then, as elsewhere, BC and Ontario obviously, obviously have had their share as well. There are a couple of differences, I think, in the Quebec case, and one of them is, is structural or, or maybe historical is the better word, in the sense that there is a long-standing institutional model in Quebec um, that means uh, that a greater proportion of the elderly are in long-term care in Quebec than elsewhere. The other factor that's played a huge role in Quebec over the past few months is the fact that healthcare workers, uh, such as nurses' aides or orderlies or cleaners, often non-unionized and underpaid, frequently worked in more than one long-term care home. And unlike in BC, uh, public health authorities in Quebec didn't step in to prevent the circulation of workers among care homes until it was far too late. Uh, even in May, some, some health workers were, were still moving from one institution uh, to another. So this question of age, uh, which has been extremely important in the spring of 2020, brings me to a second question. And this question of long-term care homes brings me to a second question. And that is the question of who cares. Uh, who took care of influenza patients in 1918-19? Who's looking after victims of COVID-19 today? Historians such as Esselt, uh, Linda Quiney and I have written a great deal about those who tried to care for the ill in Canada in 1918-19. And these people included physicians, of course, doctors, uh, but also, and, and perhaps especially, uh, nurses, nuns, volunteers, and family members. Some of his labor was paid, but much of it, and I think here of the work performed by nuns or volunteers or mothers or sisters or daughters or aunts, wasn't. This unpaid labor performed in great part by women was of course an intensified and, and, and riskier uh, form of their regular domestic labor. Some of those who've contracted COVID-19 and have fallen ill have recovered at home. So the home remains a site of care uh, today. The very sickest patients have been treated in the intensive care units of hospitals. An important number of the ill are in long-term care, uh, long care homes, as we've seen, both public and private. In the private institutions in particular, the people looking after them are precariously employed and poorly paid. Many healthcare workers without job security work, as we've seen, in several long-term care homes. Many of them belong to Montreal's migrant communities. Uh, some are asylum seekers working on temporary visas. And many of the COVID-19 cases in the community, so outside the long-term care institutions, can be found in Montreal North and in Rivière des Prairies, which are neighborhoods uh, where many healthcare workers live. And so there's a real concentration in the institutions and then in the neighborhoods um, uh, where, where healthcare workers reside. Um, not all of these orderlies and cleaners and nurses aides are women, but around three quarters of them are. And so these women find themselves having to reconcile their paid domestic labor, what, uh, what sociologists beginning with Everett Hughes have called the dirty work, 
with their unpaid domestic labor at home in conditions that are even more taxing and more dangerous uh, than usual. So the absolute, uh, I think we can say the absolute devastation wrought by the COVID-19 pandemic in long-term care homes for the elderly this spring has laid bare uh, both the fact that many existing care homes are chronically understaffed and the risks inherent to the institutionalization of a vulnerable population. And this of course brings us back to the question of age. In BC, uh, the Maritime Provinces and Quebec, the population is aging. We're dealing here with, um, with what demographers call the inverted pyramid. Uh, and in BC, this, this inverted pyramid owes something to the propensity of retired people to, uh, to, to migrate to the West Coast. In the Atlantic provinces and Quebec, it tends to be a combination of factors, uh, regional outmigration, uh, lower immigration rates, and low birth rates. And so to give you a sense of the difference between 1819 and today, in Quebec, um, persons, people aged 65 and over constituted only about 5% of the population in the early 20th century when influenza raged. Uh, in 2026, they will likely make up a full quarter of the Quebec population. And so clearly one of the collective decisions facing aging societies in both North America and Europe will be how to care for the increasing numbers of retired and elderly people over the next decades. Uh, are long-term care homes the solution? Uh, or should the state be investing in new and innovative uh, forms of home care for the elderly? This brings me uh, to the third uh, and final topic on which I'd like to touch here, uh, and that's the nature of the private home, or maybe more precisely, the relative privacy of the private home. In 1918-1919, influenza manifested itself so suddenly that both regular hospitals and makeshift emergency hospitals were quickly overwhelmed. Many, perhaps most of the ill, were thus cared for in their homes. Um, as, as Montreal novelist Jesse Symes, Syme noted about the fall 1918 wave of the epidemic, and I'm quoting her here, she said, it was impossible to move any of the sufferers into hospitals, the hospitals in Regalia, which is the name she gave to Montreal, filled up during the wave of the influenza as if by magic, and soon there was room for no fresh case. Public health authorities recommended isolating the ill in 1918-19, but there was nonetheless constant traffic between private homes and the outside world. In Montreal's early 20th century working class neighborhoods, family members, volunteer nurses, nuns, priests, firemen, stretcher bearers, moved regularly in and out of the homes of flu victims, delivering food, coal, and blankets, providing care, administering the last rites, and carrying out the dead. Indeed, home visits constituted a kind of anthropological research for many socially active middle-class women, exposed for the first time to the extent of poverty and deprivation in the city. And this constant movement in and out of flats and houses was quite different from what we are uh, seeing in the spring of 2020, which is an insistence uh, on, on social distancing and the expectation that whether we're ill or not, uh, we must self-isolate. People need to self-isolate, leaving their homes only for necessities such as groceries. And what struck me, one of the things that struck me is that it, it's appeared quite easy for many Canadians, uh, particularly salaried Canadians able to perform non-manual labor from a distance, to hole up in their homes and rely upon the internet and online grocery orders and Netflix. Uh, the private home appears to be much more private now than it was in 1918, or at least for those with stable sources of work and some savings. And yet, uh, after 12 weeks of lockdown, the toll taken by isolation and solitude on the elderly in particular, but also on teens and children, is becoming very clear. We've seen a significant number of people over the age of 70 isolated in their homes with visits from family members prohibited. They will no doubt be asked to self-isolate longer than other citizens as provinces open up again and deconfinement begins. In Montreal, as in many other places in Canada, high schools and most primary schools will remain closed until September. Children and especially teenagers are champing at the bit 
uh, deprived of the structure and sociability of school, sports, and time spent hanging out with their friends. Historian of children and youth, Cynthia Camacho, goes so far as to argue that COVID-19, and I quote, is the generational marker of these teenagers, defining their cohort identity historically and through every stage that remains to the end of their lives. End of the quote. On October 31st, 1918, Montreal Mayor Médéric Martin wrote a highly critical letter to the city's Board of Health, arguing that the board had dawdled and that its efforts to halt the spread of influenza in the city were essentially too little, too late. Similar criticisms have been leveled at Quebec's current premier, François Legault. Public health experts and armchair observers alike have argued that self-isolating measures should have been put in place in Quebec as early as March 5th or 6th at the end of the province's spring break and before travelers returned to work and children went back to school. Hindsight, of course, is 2020. While we are already able to draw some lessons from the current crisis, the longer term consequences of the COVID-19 pandemic are difficult to predict, at least as long as we remain in the midst of history. Thank you. All right, am I good to go? Okay. Um, well, thank you again uh, to Magda. That was a, a fascinating um, presentation. I think it uh, leads quite well into what I wanted to talk about tonight. Um, I guess I'd, I'd start off on a personal note about saying how I think bizarre the whole experience has been as an historian watching this uh, pandemic unfold. Um, as as I was suggesting a few minutes ago, there was this kind of period in the late 2000s when um, there was a lot of discussion about possible future pandemics. There's a lot of funding in the United States and so, to some degree in Canada as well uh, to help fund um, research into what to do in a new pandemic. And on one hand, I think uh, I always felt like this was something that I was at least on the periphery of, um, but I don't think I ever really thought I would be living through what's going on right now. And I think what's been so strange for me is that as a historian, I'm simultaneously both an expert in the area and I, and I know what, um, uh, I know more than the average citizen about what's happening, but I'm also not an epidemiologist. So you kind of feel, at least for me, um, like you're always kind of looking at this almost as an historian in real time, what's, what's happening now and I'm trying to figure out how people are going to look back on this uh, in future generations. And that's really what I want to talk about tonight, because I think what has fascinated me the most is the way in which history has been both uh, simultaneously invoked um, by the media, by epidemiologists, by public policymakers, uh, as well as ignored. And I think um, those two things happen often at the same time. Uh, we cherry pick, as we often do, I think, in uh, popular discussions or public discussions, examples that, that fit what we, uh, the narratives that we're already crafting um, beforehand. I think for me, the, the thing that the way in which I think future historians will look back on coronavirus will be very different than the way in which we're experiencing it for obvious reasons. I think that's probably a bit of a trite uh, observation, but when I started writing my flu book, what initially fascinated me, fascinated me about the influenza pandemic in 1918 was it was seemingly this massive, largely back in the 2000s, somewhat still unknown event. Uh, and I thought I was going to kind of delve into these archival sources and realize, you know, discover things that um, this kind of major event that had transformed society. And as a very brief kind of personal anecdote, my great grandmother um, was 106 when she passed away in 2006, when I was still doing some of this research and I was able to actually talk to her. And I thought, I'm gonna have this chance of talking to this 1918 survivor. And I remember going with my tape recorder to, to go and record her because she was still sharp as a tack at that point. And I said, Nanny, so what was 1918 flu like? And she said, oh, Mark, it was terrible. Let me tell you about the time we got quarantined for smallpox, though, when I was a little girl in 1910. And uh, the reality was that she had almost no memory of the 1918 flu. And the more I got into it, the harder I, I, I found it to actually get traction as an historian, because so little of what happened in 1918 seemed to have a lasting effect. There were lots of things that uh, happened at the time that were um, significant, but um, as uh, I argue in the book, what flu really did was exacerbate latent underlying tensions. It didn't really 
um, provoke any kind of revolutions. The, the only thing that came out of it was this 1919 Federal Department of Health, which ultimately failed, but um, eventually gave rise to uh, the creation of at least a, a, a federal interest in public health in Canada. And I think, weirdly, historians in the future are going to have a similar response to the coronavirus. One of the problems with 1918, the flu, was that in fact about 99%, 98% of people who got the flu survived. And that in comparison to all the other epidemic diseases in circulation in 1918, flu was a relatively mild illness in comparison to even things like measles, scarlet fever, diphtheria, tuberculosis, any of these other diseases. That's why my nanny said, oh, well, what about the smallpox uh, epidemic? That was a much more serious disease in her mind. And I think when we look back many years from now on COVID, I think one of the things that people have to admit right away is that in fact, on the grand scheme of things, this is too a relatively mild disease in the sense that the infection fatality rate is relatively low, certainly compared to lots of other diseases. And that in fact, as historical epidemics go and historical pandemics go, um, this is not going to be um, one, of the, one of the major ones in history, at least in terms of its of demographic effects. It, it's, uh, it tends to kill, unlike the 1918 flu, which, as Magda suggested, killed relatively young, healthy individuals who are not only breadwinners and parents, but people who contributed um, uh, to the demographic future of society in that sense. This disease has a very different profile. So what I think historians are going to focus more on um, are the things that I probably ended up focusing on in 1918, the official and the popular responses to the disease. And I think the thing that will fascinate people the most is probably going to be why we reacted in the way that we did um, to this disease that in comparison to things like HIV, AIDS, tuberculosis, um, a number of other problems that um, we end up, I think, largely sweeping aside as we discuss uh, coronavirus or focus exclusively on coronavirus. Um, I think that those will, it'll be that response that we're become so interested in as historians. So for me, I think as a 1918 flu historian, what really struck me in watching the events of the last few months unfold and getting asked to comment on this in the media uh, in a number of occasions is the way we so quickly developed a universal response uh, to the pandemic in a way that I is certainly unprecedented in history. Um, the move towards lockdown happened remarkably quickly. I don't know how many people were following things back in January, but um, when this disease first emerged in, in Wuhan, I was following it um, relatively closely. And all the commentary initially was, well, no one in the West will ever attempt anything like was attempted in China. And then very quickly in February, that narrative began to shift, and it began to shift as mortality began to look much higher. Initially, the uh, World Health Organization suggested it could be as high as 3.4%, um, and you end up with uh, um, moves to try um, and avoid what happened in Italy, which was an overwhelming of the healthcare system there. And I remember sitting there in March um, and watching kind of uh, in the two weeks at the beginning of March, as the lockdowns began to kind of fall like dominoes across Europe and realizing that, well, in fact, this is going to happen here. It's going to happen everywhere. Um, and I guess what was remarkable about that to me is the way in which there was so little historical precedent to support what was actually happening at that time. And I remember getting calls from the media. And at, at that point, I was being very reluctant, at least up to that point, um, to talk to the media about this. I kept saying, I, I would get calls from various organizations and I'd say, well, it's probably better you talk to an epidemiologist about that. I don't want to kind of confuse the message. And then we began to see these discussions coming out about, you know, comparisons between St. Louis and Philadelphia, um, the way in which some cities had locked down in the U.S. in 1918, others had in mortality in those cities and what had happened. I'm sure everybody can think back to those graphs and remember um, those graphs that appeared everywhere on social media and in newspapers, trying to compare what would happen if you flatten the curve and what would happen if you didn't. And it was at that point that I began to realize how little context people were um, discussing these historical examples with, right? And um, I'm happy to get into it later in, in, in the question period if anybody's interested. Um, but there's a lot more to comparing what happened in St. Louis and in Philadelphia than simply, you know, putting up a graph. And what also struck me was kind of like as it was suggesting at the beginning is I've gone away from this. I, I you know, a book comes out in 2012. I defended my dissertation, I think in 2009 or something like that. And 
I really hadn't revisited flu much since then. And the reality was that this kind of drew me back into it. And the strange thing is I have a vivid memory of sitting on panels with people um, as, you know, the token historian, um, with people from the CDC and, 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 and other places uh, in the U.S. where it was being discussed, what would you do in, in the next pandemic, this sort of thing, pandemic preparedness in general. And non-pharmaceutical interventions came up repeatedly. And I remember so vividly talking about how I thought the way in which, you know, Alberta had proactively in 1918 mandated wearing masks, for example, or Saskatchewan, um, attempts to, you know, ban public gatherings, how these were proactive responses that might well have had some kind of effect on mortality and, and or at least uh, morbidity in terms of the spread of the disease. And I remember people kind of, you know, looking at me and saying, oh, isn't that kind of nice uh, that you would think that, but, you know, this isn't really how non-pharmaceutical interventions work. They aren't really all that effective. And so I guess what I found so interesting was the way in which the narrative had clearly shifted in 10 years away from this idea that flu is something you could control through limited interventions to this idea that you could actually stop a new novel respiratory disease in its tracks with lockdowns. And the reality is so much of that was based on, I think, modeling, um, which to me is such a fascinating topic um, to look at where those models come from. Because again, a lot of the most famous models that were used to inform policymaking around coronavirus Imperial College model, for example, were largely influenza models that had been adapted um, with new inputs uh, for coronavirus. And what the narrative was back in February and more so in mid-March as, as we started to kind of shift into this lockdown mode that we're all still in today, at least to an extent, um, was that the purpose of the lockdowns themselves weren't to prevent mortality. It was to do what uh, some people argued happened in 1918, which was to control the spread of the disease, to flatten the curve, as we would say today, in the hashtag way, um, in order to prevent hospitals from being overwhelmed. And I think what is remarkable to me is the way in which, since that point in time, um, as we've learned more and more about the problems that lockdowns also bring about, and indeed there were many people, including myself, very early on, who were saying that you know, there would be these problems. They, these were not unforeseen, uh, unforeseeable things that have begun to develop um, the secondary effects of lockdown versus the virus itself. What's fascinating is the way in which the move towards these universal lockdowns, to me at least, um, the policy trap that they put politicians into. Because what I think was also so remarkable, which historians will be interested in, was the way in which people almost universally bought into lockdowns in a way in which I don't think policymakers, public health officials believed was actually going to be possible. And I had a few discussions early on with various people that seemed to indicate that this was the case, that the fear initially was that no one would buy into the lockdown. And I think one of the problems that we run into now is that people are genuinely terrified. And that as knowledge about the disease has evolved, as we've learned more, as inevitably we do about any disease, one of the problems that we run into is how do you pivot away from a policy which in many ways has been so successful? And we can argue about the degree to which lockdowns are responsible for flattening the curve or um, other effects like that. But the policy itself has been effective in the sense that people have bought into it, have changed their daily behaviors, have changed their life patterns, have actually done all of these things that I think many people didn't expect we would willingly do. And the problem that we then run into is as we begin to realize that the models in many cases were not right in the sense that hospitals were unlikely to be overwhelmed, are unlikely to be overwhelmed, that it becomes very difficult then to see how you end up turning this corner going forward uh, in which you try and actually open things back up. Uh, and I think we're seeing this, you know, uh, throughout the West that as these, this idea about um, lockdowns versus uh, uh, opening up the economy, quote unquote, becomes politicized, it becomes as much a problem to convince people that it's not a political choice, that these are things that, you know, we might be able to do as a result of more information we've learned about the disease that is not just simply about um, this necessary kind of policy response at this point. And I guess the point I'd conclude on with all of this is that, again, we're kind of in the middle of this, right? If not still towards the beginning. And so ultimately, when historians look back on these few months, these will probably be some of the most pivotal months because they set the stage for everything that's gonna come later. 
But how we're judged in the last three months is largely going to come down to what happens in the fall and in the winter. Is there a second wave? And there's good evidence to suggest that there will be, uh, but there's also evidence to suggest that we simply don't know because flu and coronavirus are not the same things. And in many ways then, the verdict of history is going to rest on that kind of development. But either way, politicians and policy makers are going to have a problem, which is that in a so-called second wave coming up, how do you go back to a lockdown situation having spent the money and uh, can, you know, come out of it like we're likely to do over the summer? Is that even a possibility? And if it's not, do you run the risk of convincing people then that everything they gave up in the spring, they sacrificed in the spring was in vain? And this too, like I think Lord King mentioned in, uh, um, early on in, in England, leads to the possibility of widespread social unrest. Um, and this is that element of the popular response too that I think has gone has been so neglected by historians. How do people actually respond uh, to months and months of being locked down? They might buy in early on, um, but the question is, can this go on uh, um, forever? And the reality is no. Um, at some point, people do reach a breaking point. And I guess that's the point that I would end on there is this idea again that uh, we're kind of still at the beginning, but we're witnessing. Um, the unfolding of history, obviously, at the moment, um, but we still, I still think we have no idea how the present is actually going to be looked at um, uh, as we uh, move into the future. So with that, I will hand it over uh, to Dr. Jones. Thanks. Um... Mark did a very, very nice job um, in his comments, setting me up um, to talk about the question of social inequality and social unrest, which is something that I've, um, my work has been really focused on, uh, on influenza. And I started off thinking about questions of um, working class experience, uh, particularly in relation to the 1919 general strike um, in Winnipeg, which was by no means the only source of labor unrest in Canada in the early part of 1919. So I want to talk about my reflections, I guess, about what happens during a pandemic in a society, which is to say, I think just basically every society with deep social hierarchies. Um, uh, influenza, the influenza pandemic at the end of the First World War used to be referred to and still sometimes is referred to as the, a democratic disease, which is to imply that everyone was vulnerable and it affected people in the same way. Um, but it's not the same thing to observe that there were cases of influenza across classes, ethnic groups, races. Um, it's not the same thing to say that it is as it is to say that the disease affected everyone equally or that it was the same experience for everyone. And certainly data is part of a solution to this problem. And we see this today as data on the relationship between social inequalities and mortality are very complete. And um, as, as a historian, they were very incomplete as well for the period that I was studying. And historians and geographers and others have had to very painstakingly gather um, information that gives um, you know, income levels, that gives ethnic background, um, that, that talks about what happened with on-reserve Indigenous people and so on, had to go through that rather painstakingly and piece it together. And that picture is still very incomplete. And in Canada, I can think, for example, of the rural experience, which is very little understood. And my research focused entirely on the urban context, on particularly on the urban poor. Certainly, there were a lot of inequities with the fallout from the 1918-19 pandemic. Um, there were inequities globally between countries, um, places like Canada and the United States, which had death rates about six per thousand population, um, were much lower than there, than there were you know, death rates in parts of Africa, for instance. And again, we're still sort of starting to understand parts of what happened in what we call now the global south. Within countries, there were certainly variable rates and the mortality rates uh, among on-reserve Indigenous people, for instance, were up to um, 10 times as high uh, as they were among non-Indigenous Canadians. And that's a very incomplete picture because it only counts those people who were 
um, status Indians under the Indian Act living on reserve. So many Indigenous families uh, we know would have been at high risk for um, a respiratory disease like influenza because of the spread of tuberculosis through their communities and through the residential school system. So there's a lot of history there that um, that uh, is an important part of the piece, the puzzle, important part of the puzzle to what happened in Canada. Among the urban poor, disparities were not as great as, the, as we can see the disparities between Indigenous and non-Indigenous, but it was certainly consequential. Um, Anne Herring and Ellen uh, Coral in an essay in the, in the collection that Magda and I did found that um, in poor immigrant and working class districts in Hamilton, for instance, their death rates there are 1.75 to two times higher than they were in wealthier areas of the city. And that, I think, can be explained by the fact that living conditions were unhealthy and, and unsafe um, during a pandemic outbreak. They were overcrowded. There was a lack of clean, hot running water. Um, fuel supplies were potentially a risk factor because un unclean sources of heating fuel um, like bituminous coal were used. Um, spaces were small and unventilated. So when disease struck, it tended to run quite rapidly through families. And um, I don't have hard data on this, but certainly if you read um, various reports of how influenza affected poor neighborhoods, you see that happening where it's running through um, entire families. The other key piece to what happened, I think, in that period was very limited access to health care in a period before Medicare. So there was inequitable health care access according to class and income levels. Um, so usually public hospitals, which were just starting to grow in number and size in Canada, had some forms of economic financial means test. So it was, uh, you know, a kind of stigmatizing, um, undignified process that working people hated. Um, there was also frequent racial segregation for visible minorities and indigenous people in the public hospital system. So access to care was very fragmented, to say the least, um, if not uh, directly inequitable. So from the start of the COVID-19 outbreak, I, I've been watching, of course, to see where first of all, where resistance arises from and where inequities become very evident because it, it, I don't like the, you know, like all historians, I'm not going to put on my, you know, predictor hat, um, get out my crystal ball. But it, I would have been very surprised if there weren't inequities that became part of our understanding of the disease um, because Canadian society, like U.S. society, has deep systemic inequalities. Um, we don't know exactly what, how this is going to work out yet. It's like, you know, like Mark said, this is early days in terms of being able to provide perspective on what we're living through. Certainly the impact of racial inequity in the U.S. is very alarming, particularly for African Americans, as they are, as Magda has um, spoken a bit about here in Montreal, where workers of color are drawn into this very problematic long-term care um, uh, system, I guess. Workers who are at the bottom of the occupational hierarchy, many of them newcomers, many of them in vulnerable immigration status um, situations. So those inequities, how do you explain them? Um, well, it's not about biology, it's partly about decisions. Um, decisions that governments make or don't make about disease containment. And the burden of disease control measures never falls equally on everyone. And there are lots of historical examples of that during COVID-19. Of course, as Mag just said, middle class people with salary can live comfortably at home and work there. Um, while many working class people cannot stay home um, if they are able to keep employment. Closures in the service industry in Canada are disproportionately impacting women in the workforce. And it's difficult to see how this won't have long-term impacts on gender equality in the workplace um, in Canada, uh, because, especially if um, efforts by government continue to be focused on projects that they call shovel ready, which are you know, infrastructure projects that very few women get employed in. So we need a gendered lens through which to look at the recovery from economic shutdown. 
But the biggest problem, I agree with Mark, for a flu historian, is how, what do you think about the shutdown and how do you understand it? Because it has no real parallels in 1918, 19. The shutdowns were of an order of magnitude different. Um, there was closed schools and churches in some places of leisure, but not massive closures of workplaces um, and not such deep unemployment, which poses its own challenges. So it's difficult to comment on this aspect of disease control from a historical perspective. So one can, of course, speculate that these closures saved um, us from much larger human losses, but this can not really be known with certainty, um, with all due respect to epidemiological modeling. Um, every infectious disease behaves in unique ways and comparisons are um, interesting, but I think still largely speculative. Um, and future historians are going to have to draw conclusions again about the impact of particular health measures, some of which those impacts are only going to become evident over the longer term. And here I want to say that numbers, I think, are only part of the, of the, the picture. Um, the flu stories or the, the historical memories of the urban poor and racial minorities in Canada during the influenza pandemic really emphasize and explain how qualitatively different an event it was for them than, say, for example, um, the middle class and upper middle class female volunteers who went into the homes of poor people during the pandemic. Um, so often memories among working class people evoke the importance, for example, of mutual reliance in order to survive during an era of no income supports or public health care. And the impression left here is that the influenza pandemic was a communal event, not an individual one, despite the fact that the framing of public health messages was largely about individual behavior and the role of the individual in controlling the disease. And that shared experience is something that I've written about in my work and that I, I believe still, um, uh, you know, it gets more complicated when you're living through a disease to understand your prior frameworks. Um, but I think that one of the reasons we see post-pandemic labor unrest in Canada after 1918-19 is this shared experience. So in Winnipeg, for example, the general strike reaches far beyond organized labor. Those members who are in one way or another connected to um, the labor movement so how can we explain this and how does this issue of the exploitation of labor become a wider concern with massive public meetings, peaceful demonstrations, and uh, during the strike six weeks of sustained solidarity, which was su uh, sufficiently threatening that it was only ended with state violence. Um, so living through the emergence of public unrest today has given me, I think, some greater um, maybe emotional intelligence around this puzzle that has always interested me. What's the connection here um, between um, social unrest and epidemic disease? Uh, because history is full of these connections. Cholera in the 19th century, the second major wave of cholera in Europe was uh, 1848, which is the year of the publication of the Communist Manifesto. Um, public unrest in India in response to the outbreak of the bubonic plague there in 1896. Examples are pretty much um, endless, but the, how that works is still very difficult to interpret. So I've been watching to see where resistance might emerge, and at first it seemed like this was going to be opponents to public health closures um, supported by the populist right um, and by anti-vaccination movements. But in the last week, things have changed again. And the way in which the police killing of George Floyd has galvanized a very broad network, broader than usual, it looks like, alludes to something about this complexity, right? That it's the resistance may not arise directly related to a health crisis, but it nonetheless bears some of the marks of a health crisis. So groups like Black Lives Matter, built on generational struggles for Black um, equality, and like labor rights in the early 20th century, this is an already existing social issue that COVID doesn't cause, but it in some way highlights it. And I just want to conclude by quoting from um, a woman named Roxane Gay, who writes for the New York Times. She's an African-American woman 
uh, she wrote an article on May 30th um, called Remember No One Is Coming to Save Us um, in response to uh, Floyd's death. Uh, and I think this really nicely captures, uh, you know, this kind of Rubik's Cube of pandemic and unrest. The disparities that normally fracture our culture are becoming even more pronounced as we decide collectively what we choose to save, what deserves to be saved. And even during a pandemic, racism is as pernicious as ever. COVID-19 is disproportionately affecting the Black community, but we can hardly take the time to sit with that horror as we are reminded every single day that there is no context in which Black lives matter. Um, and it just so effortlessly brings these things together. I've, I've read that quote um, a number of times. So pandemics expose social injustices. We hear that now a lot, uh, existing ones. They also, in my opinion, create new ones, new sources of injustices, new things to think about. Um, and they, older, they also give older uh, struggles for social justice a renewed relevance. Um, critiques of the state come much more easily to people during a pandemic crisis. And the kind of common sense of the way things are um, can seem suddenly uh, not as common sense to us anymore. Um, and I think how that happens is specific to the historical context. And um, sometime a historian will um, have this conversation about COVID-19 and um, the path of resistance during it. So thank you, I'm finished. Um, so Mark and Magda, do you want to turn on your um, mics and cameras? Um, it's almost seven already. So maybe we could have just a little bit of back and forth that Magda has agreed to start off on. And then um, if there are questions, now would be a time for um, audience members to put questions on the chat um, and we'll try to um, respond to them. Right. <clears throat> well, thank you. Uh, thank you, both of you, Esselt and Mark. Uh, it, it's really interesting because I think there are, um, there are many links among what we've all presented, many commonalities, and of course, each, each of us has our, our own take on it. Um, three things that I'd like to mention, three things that I took away from listening to the two of you, and, and maybe you can, can build on this. One is the question that, uh, that Mark raised explicitly, but I think it was in all of our presentations, is this question of the lasting consequences, right? What, what are we going to take away? What are we all going to take away from this pandemic? Mark also raised the question, what will we remember, uh, which is a related question, not identical, but what will we take away from this and, and what will we build maybe as a result of this? Um, when I was working on the flu in Montreal, I wrote a bit about a woman named uh, Eva sirce uh, who's the subject of a biography written by André Lévesque. But during the flu epidemic, Eva Circe Côté wrote in a labor newspaper under a masculine pseudonym, uh, Julien Saint-Michel, and she had this long article where she said, uh, it's always the same, she said, in every epidemic, everyone says, never again, we have to prevent epidemics instead of reacting to them, uh, this time let's do it. And then she said, but actually, I don't believe that. I think after this is done, we're all just gonna crawl back into our shell. And so I guess that's really a huge question, and we see it in the press today. Is, you know, everyone says, okay, how do we build the post-pandemic world? What are we gonna do differently? And so I'm, I'm anxiously, you know, like everyone, I think I'm holding my breath to see what can we, will we, what will we build differently? I think that's a, a very important question. Um, another question that, that both uh, Mark and Esselt raised is the question of opening up again. You know, how you, how you transition from, the, from a period of, of lockdown or what we're calling in Quebec confinement to an opening up. And it, it's complicated because we, on the one hand, there's this public health analysis that goes on, a weighing of risk, what's an acceptable level of risk, what are people willing to live with in terms of risk. But there's also the question of the, legitimacy, uh, the political legitimacy of a government and the credibility of a government. And I think that's what we're seeing here in Quebec right now is that in some ways, um, I mean, we have a very pro-business government here right now that wants to open up to get the economy back on track. But I think some of the deconfinement measures are also happening because the government sees that people are starting to congregate anyway. They're having people over to the, in their backyards, they're, they're having bar barbecues. And so if the government doesn't allow this, 
it, it loses face. So there is the public health calculus that goes on, but also this question of, of political credibility. And then maybe the third question that I would raise that comes out of uh, Vessel's talk is this, is this question of causality. And, and it is really interesting because I think as historians, we often do see links or we think we see links between disease and social unrest. We assume that there must be a link, that these must be important. And, and we spend a lot of time, I think, in the archives looking for the smoking gun that's going to prove that the Winnipeg general strike was a direct uh, outcome of influenza. I think living through this pandemic, as Esselt said, um, it, it, it's fascinating because it allows us to feel that link and, and maybe also to feel that our instincts as historians are right. And that even if, in, you know, when we're looking at the past, we can't find the smoking gun, it's not preposterous to make those, those causal links. So I'll stop there and leave, leave time and room for, for others. Well, maybe if I'll just um, uh, pick up on a, a, a couple of those comments. And uh, one of the things that kind of struck me listening to both panelists was again, um, this notion that uh, it's so hard to kind of make sense of uh, what will be an historical event as it's still unfolding, right? Um, what I was thinking of when Ezla was talking um, was again, kind of going back to uh, an article that I used to have a lot of trouble uh, understanding when I was working on my own flu research which was um, Richard Evans' article on epidemics and revolutions. And um, I remember being so perplexed by that article because it felt like cholera should have caused revolutions. And that when you actually boil down to it, you, you know, you, the argument being that epidemics bring latent tensions to the surface, they don't necessarily um, themselves cause revolutionary change. And I think as I was getting at that and, and, and she did in, in, in her work on um, the Winnipeg General Strike, but I think that that's also one of these, that's the next chapter that we're going to face here in, in COVID, right? That um, eventually as this all at some point comes to an end, um, the question will be, what are the lingering effects as Magda was suggesting a minute ago? And I think in a lot of ways, it, those things have been brought uh, to a boil um, at the moment and will be over the next few months. Um, will probably tell us a lot more about uh, what the lingering effects of this epidemic will be. And I'm just curious what, whereas, I, don't, I know you don't want to put your crystal ball out. And <laughs> I'm just curious what you think, like where, where you think this goes in terms of the lasting change that, that comes out of this. If, if, if this pandemic, maybe Magda II in, in, in Montreal, is exposing these kind of latent um, uh, tensions and problems beneath the surface, many of which are longstanding for decades, we, we know all about. Um, does it provoke change or do we eventually go back to normal? I mean, that, I think that that's such a big historical question and a very unfair one too, so. Well, maybe I could look at back to something that Magda said about political legitimacy because I, I think it's really important um, right now as we're living through a, moments of un unrest that are emerging to think about the way in which those moments of unrest were resolved in the past um, and whether or not we're a society that is okay with using violence to suppress what comes up. Um, so when we say, well, you know, this lays bare inequities, which everyone now seems to, in, at least in the liberal media, seems to agree with, um, well, what does that mean? I mean, it, it's not just, it's not an intellectual problem. It's it's a problem also of political legitimacy. How, how does our, our, in Canada, our elected government or how does the American government respond to what that brings forth, you know? And I think to some extent, what will happen next depends on that response because if you use force, um, if there is a repression, an act of repression and suppression of dissent, it makes it much harder for the, you know, the claims on greater equality that people might make to gain any traction. Um, and they take longer to get to that point. But one of the things I didn't talk about, which I have been thinking about a lot, is how much public health officials after 1918, 19 talked about the importance of public trust and how, how much they define public trust as consent. And they yeah. didn't see any point in um, 
quarantine, for instance, which is very different from what we hear. We still want consent, but we want consent for lockdown, right? And it's, so their, their consent had more to do with education and with being able to convince people to follow, you know, um, better hygiene practices um, and so on. I think at the time, nobody expected the public to give consent for widespread um, isolation or quarantines because these had historically invoked pretty negative responses from people. Um, and what public health officials at the time wanted was that people would come forward and report their cases and they didn't want them hiding their cases in the home. And we still don't know the extent to which, like every, every day it seems I read a new article in the newspaper about how excess deaths don't line up with the COVID deaths, that they are far greater than the reported number of COVID deaths. So I think we are still trying to figure out um, how people did respond to the lockdown and um, you know what, how that relates to political legitimacy going forward. And I think once you lose legitimacy, um, everything uh, is kind of up for grabs in a way and not in a good way, usually, you know, doesn't end well, usually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Maybe one thing I would just add to that, uh, to the last thing you said, Ethel, is it's, it's been fascinating here to watch the consensus break down, right? Yeah. Um, about, or, you know, I would say for all of the month of March and a good part of April, there really was this consensus um, of, of people, people obeying the rules, but without any um, coercive measures in place, right? These were the, the, the state was relying on public cooperation and people seem to be following the rules. And there was a, a, a great degree of support for Legault, much more than there had been before the pandemic started. And I would say for the last three, four weeks, that started to break down, partly as more information has come out about the extent of the, of the devastation yeah. in the long-term care homes. And as you say, all of a sudden, these numbers that don't that don't add up or 300 new deaths that no one had talked about that suddenly appear. And mm -hmm. so it is very interesting to, it was interesting to watch the consensus hold for a good six weeks. Uh, and it's very interesting to watch it break down. Uh, and I have no yeah. idea what's going to happen over the summer. Mm -hmm. So I have a couple questions. I'm kind of trying to uh, look at them as we receive them. Um, one of the questions which I thought, Mark, you might like to think about or talk about is um, mental health. And the um, question refers specifically to potential PS PTSD cases. Um, and what do you think about the mental health impacts? Well, either of you, Magda, because you, you mentioned that too, about the mental health impacts on providers, but also on... Um, people in general. Um, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll start um, and then um, I begin with a caveat that I'm an historian and uh, take what I say with a grain of salt here. But um, one of the, the things that doctors in 1918 believed about shell shock um, while flu was happening, and again, as Ezra suggested a few minutes ago, there is no precedent in 1918 for what people are going through today. So we have to be careful doing that. Um, in terms of lockdowns and that sort of thing. Um, but there is this kind of assumption that uh, prolonged um, inactivity in the face of danger can be a real problem uh, for mental health. You, you live in a heightened anxiety state for weeks or months on end. Um, your body's in a constant flight or fight response. And this kind of goes back to that policy trap that I was referring to in my talk, right? Is that we've successfully scared people um, and as a result, uh, people are literally have been in many cases in that kind of hunkered down fight or flight response for weeks. Um, we don't know what that does to people on a massive scale. Um, so when we talk about first responders, when we talk about um, uh, doctors, nurses and hospitals, um, yes, they're likely to also face similar problems too. Um, the reality though is again, it's gonna be felt disproportionately in different parts of society. Um, in the workplace, especially in hospitals, there are already programs in place to help people deal with some of those types of problems. Um, we do not have a very good track record of dealing with mental health as a society in general. Um, and as we begin to cope with the problems that come out of this, uh, 
um, we don't have the infrastructure. I mean, I think um, I, I remember reading before the pandemic that uh, the backlog to see a psychiatrist in Ontario can be many, many, many months. Um, and the idea that we're going to be able to get help for people if they are in trouble during this or afterwards, um, I, I, we don't have that system in place. And again, I think this pandemic is going to reveal that in the same way that it revealed uh, the promise of long-term care. And we're starting to see that now with reports about increased suicide rates, et cetera. Um, and we, we really just don't have those supports in place, especially for people who are in the most vulnerable populations. Mm -hmm. Magda, do you want to speak to that one or do, I, do we want to go down the list a little bit? Uh, I'll, I'll just speak quickly to it. I think uh, what's been very interesting is I don't think anyone had measured the impact of isolation on, on, on people's mm -hmm. mental health. And we are starting, as Mark said, we're starting to see articles now that, that are measuring that and that also reveal that our sense of being constantly plugged in and social media gives us, it's in some ways a false sense of sociability and it doesn't make anyone at the end of the day much less lonely. I'm not very optimistic though about uh, about the measures that will be taken post pandemic around mental health. I think that if there are measures taken here, in the first place, it will probably be measures for the elderly and, and attempts to attack the problem of long term care uh, long before the mental health uh, solutions are, are developed. That maybe links into one of the questions with a couple of people asked questions actually about what we think you know, one of one of the differences might be the role of communications technology, both from the public health perspective, the tools that public health has now, but also in terms of, you know, how ordinary people are living through the pandemic. Um, I don't know whether there's, uh, the differences are fairly, I think, clear in some ways, although um, the early 20th century public health people were very experienced with infectious disease and dealt with it all the time, not, not just flu, but of course all different sorts of infectious diseases. And for given the technological tools they had, they had fairly sophisticated ways of communicating and in, including, you know, translations into different languages among urban immigrant communities and so on. Um, I don't, I guess what I'm getting at there is that I'm, I don't know whether the vast availability of information on the internet or social media possibilities improves our situation or makes it worse or or neither right i don't know either of you want to jump in i, I would agree with that as in the sense that um uh, one of the most frightening aspects of this pandemic has been information overload right um, I've certainly found myself in some days where I'm almost tethered to my phone reading different international stories as they come up and it, and it creates that kind of weird anxiety feeling just in general of, of well there must be a new breaking story that's going to come out now and I need to look again because it's been five minutes since I checked and that's abated somewhat now but there was a moment where events are moving very quickly and I think what struck me is two things one is the availability of information in real time you can now go on and read a medical preprint when it is uh, published or not published, but posted to a preprint server um, at the exact same time as experts in the field around the world as a lay observer. And it can go onto social media, be misinterpreted, correctly interpreted, and you know go viral or not. And at the same time, we have this lag where I think oftentimes, and it's not fair to our public health officials, they're actually dealing with the crisis in real time and real problems in terms of what's happening right in front of them. And they might not actually have the same amount of time to go through those preprints constantly. And I've been struck in the number of briefings that you see that, you know, are all of course now posted on the internet. You can watch public health officials give the briefings in which they may not be as familiar as a reporter with a story that just broke two hours earlier um, about, you know, what's happening in Germany or in South Korea or something like that. Um, and in 1918, it was obviously a very different scenario where the media landscape was very different, information transmitted much uh, more slowly, obviously. Um, but to your point, I'm not sure this is a good thing because I think it, it creates this feedback loop where there's always the expectation that politicians will be reacting instantly to some perceived crisis that is broken out on social media, which can lead to kind of, in Ontario, our premier comes out every day with a new announcement. 
And that announcement is always heralded as going to be something significant. And most of the time it, it's, it's very incremental, but there's this clear need to show you're on top of things, you're on top of the story, you're moving the narrative forward. And that's this, you get in this feedback loop between the media, social media and politicians, which is very difficult to escape from, I think. Mm -hmm. Nika, any remarks? And then I think we'll wrap up. Um, there was one question about um, the, uh, uh, whether or not there was a lack of um, scapegoating or blaming in 1918-19, hmm. um, which is, has always been interesting to me, um, although I've never really written about it. But there, there was, I think, a, not a lot of scapegoating, right? Uh, and Canada. Yeah, what I saw in, in Montreal, it's interesting, I was just thinking about this today, um, I, I spent a lot of time looking at letters that citizens, Montrealers, wrote to, to City Hall during the influenza epidemic. And essentially, most people are using the, the, the influenza pandemic as an opportunity to kind of um, let the City Hall know what's been bothering them for years, right? So all of a sudden, the, the, the epidemic becomes a pretext to dig out much older concerns. I found several letters at City Hall uh, written by Montreal small businessmen um, who made anti-Semitic remarks. And these were often small businessmen who, you know, grocers or butchers, sometimes dry goods merchants who had stores on the main, on, on saint Laurent Boulevard in what was um, the center, the heart of, of Montreal's early 20th century Jewish community. And so you'd see the anti-Semitism come out where they'd say things like, oh, this so-and-so shopkeeper who has the shop two doors down, his shop is always dirty and dusty and it's probably a source of influenza. Um, so that is what I saw, but I would say I saw surprisingly little scape ethnic scapegoating um, in 1918-19, less than I expected to find. Um, but that, that's the example that does come to mind, and I saw several examples of that. Mm -hmm. um, one of the uh, uh, audience members asked a question a little bit ago about, and, and mentioned Frederick Mattis Ambert, um, who's a Director General of Public Health in 1918, um, and I would agree that generally speaking, there was relatively little scapegoating, at least compared to other epidemics at that time. Um, but we have to remember too, I think that early on in the pandemic, the, the main effort of the federal government uh, was to try and keep the disease out, quote unquote, by closing Canada's immigrant ports, right? Mm -hmm. And so there was this kind of sense in the summer of 1918, that immigrants were going to bring in disease into the country because that's how cholera had come in, in theory, in uh, the 19th century. And what, what's interesting is that that very quickly failed, that uh, when the disease actually, when flu comes into Canada in 1918, it's largely across the Canada-US border. It's with soldiers coming from the United States into Canada. Um, it's with uh, um, Catholic uh, um, congregants who are returning from Eucharistic Congress in New York to, uh, to Quebec. Um, and so very quickly, that kind of old idea that this is an outsider disease simply evaporates because it spreads so quickly. Um, so what's fascinating to me about that is the way in which the initial policy response is at least classically um, racist and then fails and then disappears as, uh, as people begin to look at disease uh, internally within the community um, at, well, and, and look to kind of sources of infection within the community problems that were pre-existing. Yeah, it's, that's interesting. One of my favorite public health quotes is from a British medical officer of health who said in 1920, when talking about flu, that there's, there is no way to keep the wolf out of the sheepfold, um, which is just kind of a, a funny metaphor in a way, but it sort of reveals how you're right. They had just kind of like, nah, no, that's not the way we can solve this problem yeah. um, with, that, with that kind of mentality. Um, but I, I think we should wrap up because it's now 7.19 on my clock. Um, I think, yeah, I really enjoyed this. It was, uh, it was great to get to talk flu again with my uh, flu colleagues. Um, but thank you so much to the audience participants because the response to um, this series has so far been just fabulous and a very broad array of people are signing up um, to be part of it. Uh, people from different um, backgrounds, physicians, public health, 
historians, um, interested members of the public. So I want to thank everybody. And I want to ask Anya now if she, as a way of saying goodbye, if she could put up the poster for the next session. So good night, everybody.